evening. How is everyone today? Wasn't it a glorious day even though it rained? It was good. My yard looks like a, a mat. It really needed the rain today. Well, welcome to the Alice Campbell Alumni Center. Let's have another round of applause for our opening performers, for John Heidrich. With Don Heitler on the piano, Ben Taylor on bass, Jeff Magby on drums. <laughs> and we thought we should let you know that Mr. Heitler will be performing this weekend at the Chicago Jazz Festival. And Dan, was there something that you wanted to say? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he always has something to say. Uh, uh, Don, will you give us a C7 chord? This is Don Heider's birthday today. <laughs> Veterans, please stand up. All veterans, any war except the Civil War, you remain seated. <laughs> and, and, and now, would the rest of the audience please stand and give these veterans a real standing ovation. Thank you. 
The, the music of World War II is not a program you can buy on eBay. It is the result of hours of work, work involving researching times, dates, events, putting them together in a reasonable chronological order, researching music from the era, selecting the music, and now blending that into a script that you then edit and revise, edit and revise, edit and revise some more. Satisfied, you then select a talented group of musicians and just one fantastic vocalist who can sing and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> and now you've got the music of World War II. If you appreciate this program, you should realize by now the person to appreciate and the person to thank is Dan Perino. That wasn't in the script. Thanks, John. Thank now, of course, I also realize that it is impossible to please everyone. So if you do not appreciate this evening's program, well, it's my understanding that occasionally counseling will help. <laughs> music, war, war, music. How in the world do the two go together? From the beginning of time, music has played an important role in wars. Rulers of tribes and nations learned that music, in some form or other, could motivate, excite, uh, <clears throat> unify, and it was capable of developing an esprit de corps among those in the military. Not only that, but also with those at home. Music could range from the beating of drums in the early days to the flashy brass bands in the days of Caesar. Music was used to instill patriotism, not only among the troops, but also among those at home. Music seemed to thrive and grow during wartime. Songs of separation from family and loved ones were written, Till We Meet Again, or a motivational song, Over There, both written during World War I. During World War II, we would hear, it's been a long, long time. And let's remember Pearl Harbor. Publishers have reported that some 2,000 songs were written during the Civil War, 6,000 during World War I, and 8,000 during World War II. Now, the melody of a song was important, but so too were the lyrics, for it was the words that told the story of separation, love, and loneliness. Through songs, couples could express how they felt about one another and how they missed each other. Till we meet again, I'll be seeing you. It's been a long, long time. They all tell a story. Very simply, music served as a connecting link between those serving their country in time of war and those who remained at home. Tonight, through the talents of Dina Vermette, Don Heitler on piano, Ben Taylor on bass, and Jeff Magby on drums, we are going to take you back in time to remember the music of World War II. And since there may be Broadway scouts, talent scouts in the audience, we will let you showcase your talent by singing along with us on Let's Remember Pearl Harbor and on God Bless America, but not now, <laughs> later. In the mid-30s, Adolf Hitler planted the seeds of war in Europe. At that time, America was just beginning to climb out of the Great Depression. People were beginning to go back to work. This provided money for them to have social activities, going to movies, going to baseball games, and dancing to the music of the big bands. Radios and Victrolas became the entertainment center. Dancing and listening to the big bands became the number one social activity for younger and older adults. It seemed everyone danced almost anywhere they could hear music, and that could be a street dance or an alley rally. In Chicago, young and old alike were dancing at the Aragon, the Trianon, and the beach walk of the Edgewater Beach Hotel. 
And as our men and women entered the military service, wherever they went, they carried this music with them. Now one song that I carried with me and had still carried with me is the last song that I heard as our ship left for Japan and then for Korea. A high school band stood, I'm not making this up, a high school band stood on the pier and as we pulled away from Pier 91, the band did not play over there. The band did not play a Sousa March. The band played so long it's been good to know you. <laughs> The year is 1938. A new five-passenger Plymouth Road King costs $685. The Yankees defeat the Cubs in four straight to win the World Series. March 12th, Germany invades Austria and soon after will occupy Czechoslovakia. The most popular song at that time came from a Broadway show called Right This Way. The song was not a success of the show, rather, but the song was and it also became one of the top songs on Hit Parade, 10 consecutive weeks in first place. Here is I'll Be Seeing You, recorded by every major singer in the business at that time. One of my favorites. Michigan in what sports writers call the greatest college football upset of the 1939 season. September 1, 1939. Germany invades Poland and then Russia two weeks later. And then you remember I was born in 1939. You probably forgot that. <laughs> it's true. The popular song in the U.S. at this time was introduced and recorded by Warren Tucker's dance orchestra with a tiny vocalist singing with a tiny little voice. Who remembers who that was? Right. Perfect, Joe. I might have known you know that. Well, how about if we do that, fellas? Oh, Johnny. If I can get down here without falling down. Age is not persistence. Oh, Johnny, oh, Johnny, how you can You're my hands. 
figure is 1940. <clears throat> Gasoline is 18 cents a gallon. <laughs> Bread, five cents a loaf, and a first class postage stamp is three cents. 1940 is a pivotal year for Germany and the new Axis Alliance. Smaller nations in Western Europe are powerless. Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and then France are invaded. September 1940, night bombing of London begins and lasts for nine months. Two significant songs surface at this time. The first focuses on the continued bombing of London, and Dean is going to explain what happens. The city fathers of London are very concerned about the children during the intense night bombing. It is determined that all the children should be taken out of London and moved to the country to live with other families. As you listen to this next song, you will feel the hope for peace and the concern for the children. <coughs>
Selective Service Act. December 7, 1941, the Empire of Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. Okay. We're going to sing the second chorus, so get out the words. Second time around, you sing it, please. Page 1 of 1941. I think most of you will remember the melody. And sing out like we did in the old days.
Joe Castro, Don Heitler at the piano, Ben Taylor on bass, and Jeff Mackey on the drums. Now, how about leading me into one of the all-time favorites of that time? Don't sit under the apple tree. Remember that one? Okay, here we go. No, a flat. See, we rehearsed for eight weeks solid. Don't sit under that apple tree when anyone else but me. Anyone else but me. Anyone else but me. No, no, no. Don't sit under that apple tree when anyone else but me. Till I come marching home. Don't you go walk down lovers' lane with anyone else but me? Anyone else but me? No, 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 anyone else but me? Now I don't go walk down lovers' lane with anyone else but me till I come marching home. Many people remember the beloved uh, Faye Sims from the College of Agriculture. Uh, we were, Gary O'Brien from WDWS Radio invited some of us to be on a program to talk about the big bands and ballrooms. And uh, we talked about the various dance halls in Champaign, Urbana, and of course, every fraternity sorority dormitory had a place for dancing. Uh, Wilson's, remember Wilson's? Remember College Hall? And then later, 1941, the Union Building. Well, I remember that Faye Sims used to go to a place that maybe some of you might remember, Robeson's Roof Garden. Remember that? Anybody remember that? Oh, it was open now. So Faye said, when we said, we decided to call Faye on the telephone, and Faye said, oh, yes, I remember. He said, I had a date this night, but I only had a dollar. And, uh, and so we took the bus to Champaign, and it was 10 cents a piece, that was 20 cents. It cost 25 cents to get in the dance hall, a rose and throat, 50 cents, and 20 cents is 70 cents. Then we had a, each had a Coke at 10 cents each, and we had 10 cents left. So we walked home. <laughs> the, year, the year is still 1942, as our Marines taste victory in taking Guadalcanal after 10 months of fierce fighting. The movie Holiday Inn with Bing Crosby, Fred Astaire, and Rosemary Clooney was a big hit, along with the Academy Award winner, Yankee Doodle Dandy, with James Cagney as George M. Cohan. The year is 1943. The Wiz Kids go 17 and 1, and the Allied strategy is making headway on both fronts. Allied forces are taking back real estate, and while our situation is getting better, the Japanese suffer a great loss when their top naval officer, Admiral Yamamoto, is shot down over the Pacific. Americans are reading Betty Smith's The Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Food rationing is in full force, with shortages which include butter, flour, shortening, and fish, among the items that are declared critical. And 1943 is the year the chief doesn't dance. In his place, we have Princess Alina Wick, portrayed by Nell Smith. And as a special note to our women in the audience, the dress style is beginning to imitate military design. 
including brass buttons and coats and suits. And as we march on in 1943, we find the U.S. and our allies are beginning to realize victory on both fronts, and for the first time, we are dropping bombs on Germany. According to the hit parade, the most popular song in 1943 is popularized by Alice Faye in the movie Hello, Frisco, Hello. I'm sure you will agree that this Academy Award-winning song was truly a winner. <laughs> should surrender. General McAuliffe, the commanding general of the 82nd Division, responds with one word. How many remember the one word? Nazis. 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 Right there. Yeah. We can go back to what you have to You wear some cashews. Banjo. The year is 1944. As accentuate the positive, don't fence me in, have yourself a merry little Christmas and sentimental journey were all popular. There was a song not written by an American, but actually came from the members of the German army singing this tune during the lulls of battle. Here's the beautiful Lily Marlene.
She waits for Mussolini is captured and shot by his own people, and Hitler and Eva Braun commit suicide. Germany surrenders, May 7. In the Pacific, the Marines defeat the Japanese and Iwo Jima, and the combined Allied forces in the Pacific take Okinawa. August 6, the first atom bomb is dropped on Hiroshima, or Hiroshima, if that's what you prefer. August 14, Japan unconditionally surrenders. The tragic war has ended, but not before a total of 50 million lives have been lost. 
A total of 20,276 U of I alumni serve in World War II. 29 former athletes and 709 others with U of I ties lose their lives. Page 1, 1939, you will find God Bless America. As we conclude this program, we would like all of you to stand and join us in singing God Bless America. And as you find the words on the sheets you received, I want to tell you one more story. In 1917, a little 10-year-old girl with a big voice was entertaining troops in camps in and around Washington, D.C. 22 years later in 1939, this now 32-year-old woman was one of the entertainers at a White House state dinner held for King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, later to become the Queen Mother of England. When introducing the entertainers to the King and the Queen, President Roosevelt said, Your Majesties, this is Kate Smith. This is America. Please join us. and I'm the general manager of WILL and I want to thank all of you for coming this evening and joining us for this, this wonderful event. And we've got a lot of people to thank, so if you'll bear with me a second, let's first of all thank the wonderful uh, Don Heitler Trio and Dina Burnett. for helping to set the stage and put us in the mood this evening. Also to Dan Perino. Dan made all of the musical arrangements. And
and John Weaver, who provided the explanations and narration to go with the, the music this evening. Thank you. Thank you. The event this evening is a partnership between uh, WILL and the University of Illinois Archives Student Life and Cultural Archive Program and the University of Illinois Alumni Center. So let's thank our partners also. We're going to wear you out with applause. Uh, I'm just going to give you just a little bit of background on this project that this is the, the culmination of. WILL began this project a little over a year ago to coincide with the Ken Burns documentary, The War, which I, I hope that you had a chance to see last, uh, about a year ago. Wonderful documentary. And we realized that after hearing about the project and hearing Ken Burns speak about it, that this was a, an incredible opportunity to take the work that Ken Burns and his team did, capturing the personal stories of World War II, and to extend it to our own community, that there are not hundreds of stories, there are thousands and tens of thousands of stories that have gone largely untold all these years. And as we began to uh, cast out the net and ask for people to volunteer and come forward, what we discovered after meeting many veterans and many families of that time period was that just as Ken Burns had experienced, a lot of families had never heard the stories, that the memories of World War II were held within many people, and that Finally, there was a chance that they were being asked to tell their story, and they were comfortable. And for sons and daughters and grandchildren, it was maybe the first time that they had a perspective on their parents' or their grandparents' experiences in World War II. And that was a, a profound experience. And so we set out to produce television programs, radio programs, and web content in what was probably the largest scale cross-platform production project that WILL had ever embarked on. We, uh, we cast out the net. We recorded, to date, 48 oral histories that are on our website. We have produced 12 TV segments with veterans from World War II. We have produced six radio stories. And we're not done yet putting these stories on our website, but so far, the TV segments have already been nominated for two regional Emmy Awards. and. Two of the radio stories have won Associated Press and RTNDA Regional Edward R. Murrow Awards. So the recognition for the value of these stories is tremendous and, and very gratifying. But what the, the, the greatest satisfaction has been capturing these stories and allowing them to be sh shared with our entire viewing audience and our entire audience throughout the area. And, and that's something that public media, public radio, and public television are uniquely positioned to do and something that we hope to continue to be able to do well into the future. Uh, that we are America's storyteller and we are Central Illinois storyteller and it's something that we're very good at. So you'll be hearing more about those kinds of projects going forward as we, we try to capture the, the history of our people and our, our region. Several of the people who, for WILL, were very instrumental in the project. Uh, first of all, the producer of the TV segments was Denise LaGrasa, and she did a fantastic job uh, editing them together. Also, Henry Radcliffe, who's in back this evening and recording this event, he captured all of the oral histories that are on our website, so he was involved in every one of those productions. And uh, Tom Rogers, WILL's news director, and his team were responsible for Jeff Bossert and Jim Meadows for putting together the radio stories. And the person who helped to coordinate all of this effort within WILL is Kimberly Cronick, who is WILL's Director of Community Outreach, and she is over here. So I'd like to thank all of the WILL staff also for the great work that they did. It's only possible with partnerships, and many people have made this, this come together. And we'd like to, as I say, thank the University of Illinois and introduce also uh, Ellen Swain, who has joined us for this event. And uh, I'll get out of the way, because we have some great segments coming up that you'll, you will see. And we have the panelists who were featured in each of those segments. who get a chance to hear from them directly and a chance to ask questions and answers. 
And as you go home or when you go home from this event, be sure to check out the WILL website because all of these different segments and stories are there on the website and we will continue to add to them over the coming weeks. And we would love to have you continue to share this, take advantage of this new media technology and, uh, and let us know your comments. And uh, again, thank you for coming this evening. Good evening. Uh, my name's Ellen Swain, and I'm the Archivist for Student Life and Culture at the University of Illinois Archives. I know that's a mouthful. Um, but uh, my program is to document student life here on campus, and then the second part of the program is to uh, document fraternity and sorority life on a nationwide scale. We have one of the largest collections of fraternity and sorority materials in the country. Um, so. That's kind of what we're, we're about. I just wanted to mention two things. I hope you had a chance to look at the exhibit at the doors back here. Uh, that was produced by archives assistant Amelia Garvey. Um, and I wanted to note that many of the items in those cases came from alumni gifts, uh, diaries, scrapbooks, uh, student uh, publications, photographs. All those materials make up some of the most valuable collections that we have and have come from alumni attics and you know back rooms and uh, so if you're looking for a place to uh, house your student memories please think of us <laughs> um, and then the second thing I'd like to mention is that uh, we are very inspired by what WILL has done um, so we have started an ongoing small-scale project to document uh, U of I alumni experience during World War II and we have the first 10 interviews up on our website. We have a really great history written by a research assistant in the archives on U of I during World War II that I'd hope you will check out and look at. Um, and so if, if you are an alum who attended during that period or if you didn't graduate and you just attended here, um, we would be very happy to talk to you if that would interest you. Or if you know of somebody, please let us know as well. And this is our brochure and all of our contact information is here on the, the back of it with the website and all. Um, so I'm really anxious to hear the program and I want to thank WILL and the Alumni Association and particularly the <coughs> alumni speakers tonight. I'm so uh, excited to hear their valuable memories and experiences. Thank you. Kim uh, mentioned, or and there's Mark Len Leonard to mention, I'm Tom Rogers, I'm the news director at uh, WILL AM 580, and I'm glad to see so many people uh, coming here to this event, nice to see you. And I'd like just a show of hands first of all, and I came here a little bit late, so I don't know if it, we've, we've seen these hands yet, but how many World War II veterans do we have in the audience here? Raise your hands for all the, uh, all the veterans, and let's, let's give you all a round of applause. People in the audience were here at the U of I during that time, uh, in, in any capacity or, or, or as students or as people who are in the ROTC or whatever. You can see hands there too. Not very many. We'd love to hear from you as well. We will have a, a chance to get some uh, questions from people in the audience. Uh, I'm sure you'll want to hear what our panelists have to say. So let me start with my person to the immediate left is uh, Dr. Uh, Katie Harper Wright, who comes all the way here from uh, East St. Louis, made the trip up here, and we thank you. Um, Katie uh, uh, went to the U of I, obviously, during, the, uh, during that era, and liked the U of I so much, she stayed for her master's degree as well. Eventually uh, got her doctorate in, uh, in education, and has, uh, was a professor uh, in, in education at, uh, was Harriet Stowe College, correct? Her Harriet Stowe, State University. State University, thanks. Um, Next to Dr. Wright is uh, William Prather. Uh, <coughs> you had a, a, a bit of a travel as well from Toledo, Toledo, Illinois. Uh, <laughs> south, not Ohio, but just as good. Um, he is a retired attorney and also was a, a U of I alumnus and uh, will tell us a little about uh, your, your time spent here at the, uh, at the U of I in, in your military capacity as well. And you're an, a veteran of the Army as well. Uh, next to him is Earl Swanson. Uh, he's from Champaign. 
also not a, not a long drive, but we appreciate you here <laughs> being here. Uh, retired uh, professor of agricultural e economics uh, in the College of Aces, and uh, a veteran of the Army as well. Um, next, we have uh, Catherine Luther Henderson, who is a uh, professor of library science, retired emeritus here at the. Uh, U of I and, uh, and, and was here during that time. And, uh, to her left is Jim Stallmeyer, who is a retired professor of civil engineering and uh, uh, a, a naval veteran. Um, so his first stop in the Navy, of course, was coming to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, which has no water <laughs> to speak of, at least nothing that's, uh, that's above ground. And we thank uh, all of you for, uh, for not only taking part in, in tonight's uh, panel, but also uh, sitting down for uh, some of the oral history interviews that uh, some of our volunteer uh, uh, interviewers had given. And so we thank you for that as well. We have, uh, we have the screens coming down for uh, a presentation that uh, uh, Henry Radcliffe and Kimberly Cronick and other people have put together uh, uh, with, with Clips of some of those oral history interviews, uh, remembering the World War II era here at the University of Illinois. So let's uh, take a look at that and, uh, and be informed. Well, I was going to be 18 in August of 1944, and I knew that I would be in the service. Uh, I would get my orders uh, during that summer, as several of my classmates did. Uh, so in the spring of 1944, I decided to enlist in the Navy. My parents decided I was going to be a lawyer and where I was going to school. It, uh, so be it. <laughs> I had always wanted to go to, not always, but wanted to go to a Big Ten University because my teachers at Vashon High School in St. Louis were from the Big Ten. You have to know that back in those days, blacks could not attend the University of Missouri. And so the state of Missouri paid tuition for black scholars to go to like the University of Michigan, University of Illinois, University of Ohio, and like that. You know, they didn't have a furniture action in that days, but they let us in the universities because we were smart. I came to University of Illinois, I guess, because I, I had written an exam for a scholarship and got a scholarship, although they weren't worth a lot in uh, today's money. I thought about Purdue, which was only 60 miles away, but then I decided to come to the University of Illinois. My dad had gone to the university in 1910 and 11. In those days, an antiquated system, the men were segregated from the women. So we had uh, women's league and men's league. Now I believe it's all called student government. Right. So I got ahead and ended up as president of the men's part. And uh, that was a big deal. I was president my senior year, 1942, class 42. July the 1st, 1944, happened to be a Sunday, so that there were no offices open and few people around at 8.15 in the morning on Sunday. So I started to roam around the campus and onto the quad until I ran into a Navy person uh, who told me to go to Busey Hall, which traditionally had been a girls' residence hall but at that time was occupied by the Navy unit, Busey and Evans. I was from Missouri, remember? Right. So in order for me to get the, the, um, the Illinois scholarship and the, the uh, Illinois um, rates, you know, as a student, then my father had the mayor to write a letter saying that I was a good student and I was from, from Illinois. And then later on, I got into education. You had to have 16 hours in those days to uh, get, get uh, your certificate or whatever in uh, regular ed. So 
because I got my 16 hours in regular ed. But then I, when I came home, I taught spe regular ed until 1957. Then I was recruited to go into special and recruited with a Lions scholarship to go back to the university and get my master's in special ed. In 1939, I came down and I remember I was taken into neighbor house and they followed the same system as fraternities and had pledge classes. I can remember very vividly when the word came over the radio that uh, the Japanese had declared war on us. I was preparing uh, to lead the devotions at uh, the youth group at our, at our church. I think I revised what I was going to say in the devotions. I remember that evening because a lot of the men knew that they would be called up into service eventually. At the time of Pearl Harbor, I <clears throat> was listening to the radio and I was also studying my military lesson. After I finished, I then a number of us marched down to President Willard's home and he came out and spoke to us. His general message was uh, stay in school because the, the training you're getting right in school is useful, make you self-reliant. And, uh, and wait to be called. The, somebody came in and said, the Japanese have just attacked Pearl Harbor. Nobody in the house knew where Pearl Harbor was, but we shortly found out. I just remember that it was just, a, we were just all so scared. We were wondering if they were gonna bomb us. There was a, all this uncertainty that people were always under about what was going to happen next. Well, it was a unique arrangement because we had uh, we had regular Navy activities. I mean, we had calisthenics, which we had to do, and we had to have marching, uh, and we had to take courses in all the Navy programs, learn all the semaphore signals and everything else, in addition to taking our engineering classes. There was more emphasis on field work, I think, maybe than there would have been had the war not had the war not occurred. Then I, along with a bunch of other people, were drafted and went into what we called Army Specialized Training Corps, which uh, they taught us to a language and all how to get uh, a defeated country back in order. Things went on uh, kind of routinely with always under a, a kind of a mask of anxiety and uncertainty about what are, is going to happen to our individual lives. Well, it was very much a woman's campus except for uh, people who were not called up into the service, and except then for the uh, armed forces people who came onto the campus. Some people have asked me whether we went to Rantoul, and I said no, most of the people who were at Chanute came to Champaign-Urbana uh, because during the war years, uh, there were probably twice as many girls on campus as there were men, and therefore there was no reason for the men from Champaign-Urbana to go to Rantoul. Uh, it was rather the other way around that the uh, airmen from Chanute came to Champaign-Urbana because they knew that there were a lot of available girls. I remember that the men all left, <laughs> the fellas left, and we became friends with um, the guys from Chanute. Oh, they were good looking. They were smart too. See, those guys, most of them had graduated from college or had been to college. We were still undergrads. Sugar rationing was the first thing that I, I remember. And I have some of my rationing 
the rationing books for my family. But of course, gasoline was rationed early on. Um, we had an A uh, ration um, designation. It was not like today where many students have cars. We didn't have cars as, as students in those days. We walked a lot. I remember that I, I had a, and I still have it, a nice little license that I could put on the car, but it was rare that I was ever able to drive a car on campus because we had to save the gas. Well, it was so cold on there, and everybody, and I told you that everybody had a fur coat. And uh, so, and back in those days, that fur coat, I think, must have cost $50. But that was a lot of money in those days. He might have paid $100, $75, whatever. But I said, Dad, it is, which is true, it was so cold on that campus. And all the other girls that I knew had a fur coat. So uh, he sent me the money, and I kept that coat and wore it even as a young teacher. I was fortunate enough to spend two years in the Navy and complete three years of college education because we went to school 12 months out of the year. Uh, we went to school 16 weeks, had a week off, 16 weeks, had a week off, 16 weeks, had a week off. How the faculty survived, I have no idea. The program was disbanded in the summer of 1946 and we were all discharged at the convenience of the government. Then my Navy career ended. Uh, during that time, um, I think that the whole country was in a sense of patriotism that I've never experienced. Probably I was too young to think about it that before, but, or that I've never seen afterwards. Uh, everyone was trying to do his or her part. Despite the fact that I was in school for two years and completed three years of college, I got the GI Bill when they discharged me, so I got two more years of free education. Can't beat that. Uh, probably the most profitable military service that I can imagine. I don't want to overuse the word enjoy, but I did enjoy my experience here. Uh, and part of it was due to the fellows at Neighbor House and part of it to my friends in the ROTC. As I look back, those were some sort of harsh days, but they were good days for me. But you know, as time goes on, that smooths out the wrinkles. <laughs> so I probably had it harsher than I remember. didn't know if the mic was on. <laughs> it's on now. But let, let, me, let, me, let me start over again just to say that, you know, of the songs that we heard, uh, and, and maybe another song from that era, you know, what song comes out at you and, and gives you, you know, a, a, a sharp memory of something that happened during that era or, or what life was like during that era? Tell me a little about, about, uh, about what memory one of those songs might have brought back. Anybody can start. I will start with White Christmas, which is a song I can still never listen to because it reminded me of Christmases uh, during the war when friends, relatives were away and we didn't know where they were or what they were doing. I remember, oh, I'm sorry. One of the most descriptive is probably, and I don't recall the title, that you're in the Army, Mr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Related to all the things you gave up. Yeah, yeah, here. Is it on now? 
Yeah. Okay. I, threw, I had it the wrong way. <laughs> but it explained, it went through all of the things which you gave up and which you didn't have and how your life changed when you got up with the bugle and you went to bed when they blew taps and your life was regulated by the military. I liked uh, A-Train, Duke Ellington's A-Train, remember? But I need to put this in, and well, can I say this? Sure, go ahead. The most wonderful thing that happened to me during the war was the birth of the most beautiful and the smartest and the prettiest girl in the whole world, and she's here. <laughs> I know. She was born in 1943. I like to dance from Stardust and all of those dances. Stop. Any other thoughts? Is this on? I think yeah, the, mic, the mic's right here. So. Oh, okay. Well, in the reprise of war songs, I was surprised not to hear the song that originated here in Illinois in 1942. Were you aware that the University of Illinois used to have sort of a Harvard Hasty Pudding show? Didn't know that. Tell us Okay. Well, I happen to have written it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the the main song of that uh, was um, Goodbye Green Street, Hello Hong Kong. We're really gonna win this war. <laughs> that's, that's all I remember. <laughs> we'll need to get the lyrics from you later. <laughs> So I liked I'll Be Seeing You, and uh, I can't really tell you all about the, the context, why I like it, <laughs> but, uh, that's the one. One thing that when I was looking through some of the transcripts of the interviews that, that we did uh, with, with all of you, one thing that uh, Mr. Prather mentioned uh, that, that struck me was that uh, that era was a wonderful time to exist, in your words. And it struck me as kind of odd because, you know, for somebody who's looked back at that era and saw all the heartbreak of the war era, all the sacrifice that people made, whether they were veterans of the war or on the home front with the rationing and all that, with all that trouble in one of the most troubled eras of our time, why was it a wonderful time to exist? Because we were looking ahead to the next action whatever it was. Any other thoughts about that? How, how was it, how was it a, great, a, a good time? It was a good time for me on this campus. I enjoyed on this campus. And uh, like I said in the interview, there were some harsh times. But it was a good time for me. I know we had the war and all like that. But my, I, well, it was just a great, great time. I was successful in school on this campus was right at the CA, I had friends, and uh, it was just a really good time for me. It really was. And of course, I liked the men at Chinook, too. <laughs> well, if I were to offer a comment, I would have to say that I believe one of the dif big differences was that in the Second World War, the country knew what they were fighting for. Yeah. and. I have to, pardon me if I break up, but I have to admire the parents. Uh, I happen to be the fourth son in our family who was in the service. My eldest brother was, had already been injured when I joined the Navy. My second brother was in Africa to be followed by Italy. My third brother was in England. Uh, preparing for the invasion of D-Day, and what uh, they all survived. But my parents never complained. And with working 60 hours a week, and with four boys in the service, as I look at my own family, I see my children, and we have four sons, and they all are, to me, 
relatively the same as we were to my mother and father. And I admire what they had went through. And that's all I can say. I think that uh, the bonds that we strengthened with our, the people that we worked with and later the ones that we served with. Uh, I was overseas with the 25th Infantry Division. <coughs> and uh, I happened to be a replacement for a, an officer who had been a colleague of mine here in ROTC, Clem Clark. And uh, the fact that, that uh, the men in my platoon knew that, that helped a lot in establishing a rapport with them. So two of us, uh, both in the ROTC, uh, had a link with each other. I guess I always wondered what it would have been like to have gone to college when it was in a different time and perhaps uh, have had quite a different experience. But it was a time that I made up my mind partially what I was going to do with my life. So I guess that's always been very important. And the people who were around at that time who were very influential in, in my life uh, is something I've always been very grateful to this campus for having given me a good time in very bad times. Well, I would like to say that our war was a very well-planned war. Lots of pre-planning went into that war, and we were confident as troops that uh, what we were doing was anticipated. For one thing, the uh, Army Specialized Training Corps, where they sent us to college, for another eight months to learn a foreign language and to learn how to administer countries that we conquered, took over. And that planning, I think, uh, should serve as an example for today. <laughs> the present Pentagon could uh, learn a lot from that. I know we have a mix of, of people here uh, in, on our panel, people who were here <coughs> before the war began, who enrolled in the, in the university beforehand. Obviously, you were all at one time or another during the war uh, on campus, and there were some who stayed afterwards and watched uh, the, the campus evolve again, I guess, from, from a, a, a military uh, atmosphere to post-military, and people coming home and, and, and using the GI Bill, and, and, and staying here and getting their education, and, and the, the explosion in the number of students of, that uh, came to the U of I afterwards. Let's, I want to ask the people who were here before the war began, what, what it was like on campus and how things changed up to Pearl Harbor Day. Were, were people thinking at that time that, you know, were expecting the worst that was going to come? <coughs> I came uh, here in 1940, mm -hmm. and I graduated in 1944 and went back home to teach. Uh, but I remember uh, the Sun Pearl Harbor, the Sunday of Pearl Harbor. But I remember that our work here didn't slack up. Our classwork and that did not slack up. It seemed to me we just worked that much harder. Uh, and I remember that uh, there were a lot of the, a lot of the men had gone, but we were here. I remember working hard at the university. Mm -hmm. the, I really do, doing my coursework, and I don't remember that the war, uh, even before the war, changed the work at the at the University of Illinois. In those days, we had to work hard. We really had to do our coursework. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean in those they days? Did, <laughs> they did not have affirmative action. We were here. Folks like me, because we were smart, and uh, during the war and after the war and all like that, we had to work hard. So I don't remember that the war caused us that the, the professors let us let up in the work. But I'm trying to say. 
Was before the war began? Was there was there talk on campus about uh, you know should we go to war? Should we not go to war? Uh, <laughs> I, I, he's got a, he's got an answer. No. Absolutely not. Uh, no. The uh, I don't think so at all. Uh -huh. Before Pearl Harbor. Well, when uh, Pearl Harbor came along, I was playing bridge in a fraternity house, and we found out where Pearl Harbor was. We were drafted, went to war, and played bridge all the way across the Atlantic, and um, later on all the way back. <laughs> So it, uh, it didn't change the mental attitude. Sister, I learned to play bridge in the Union Building. <laughs> <laughs> I had not even heard of bridge, because I was raised in St. Louis, poor and everything, you know. I had never even heard of bridge. When I got to the university, we were in the Union Building and on the Tonus Bridge, and I just thought I was important and in heaven. <laughs> Well, you know what they call it now? What? Neurobics. Neurobics? Yeah, <laughs> mental aerobics. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that, that I guess, it's, it, it's indicative of the kind of social life uh, that, that was, was taking place on campuses at, at that time, too. It, it, things were different as far as what people did in their spare time when they had spare time. Because I remember talking with Mr. Stallmeyer about uh, uh, you know, a pretty rigorous class schedule. If you were, if you were in the, uh, if you were in the military, you know, what, what, what was a, what was a day like, uh, going through, going through uh, school as somebody who was also a soldier or a sailor. You're asking me, huh? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Reveille was at six o'clock, followed immediately by calisthenics, and at that time. Uh, by that, let's say, after Busey Evans, we moved to the, the, what was at that time called the men's residence halls, to just west of Huff Gym. Clark, uh, Lindgren, Barton, they're still there. I don't know what they're used for now. But uh, a long Peabody across from what is what used to be Impey, uh, there was a running track, and uh, we had a nice corpsman whom we loved, <coughs> who, who always ended our calisthenics with twice around the track. Uh, then we were free to prepare whatever we had to do for the day. And at 7.30, everyone assembled to make sure that everyone was there. And then we were free to go to our classes. Uh, the Navy required that we take a minimum of 18 credit hours which in those days, uh, considering chem labs and physics labs, was probably 28, am I correct, Robert? 28 to 32 hours a week in the classroom or in the laboratory. Uh, in the evenings, we were free to recreate or study as we wished. <laughs> At 10 o'clock, uh, taps sounded and the corpsman came around to make sure everyone was in bed. Of course, sometimes if you had a, if you had an itty bitty flashlight, you could <laughs> study under the covers. <clears throat> uh, but other than that, it was six in the morning until ten o'clock at night, and your day was pretty well regulated. And that was also evident, I guess, to anybody on campus because you, you marched to class, is that correct? No, no, we didn't march to class. Ah. No, didn't have to march to class. Everybody had their own schedule. Just as we were simply regular students, but we were students in Navy uniform. I remember seeing something out there in the, one of the displays about... Uh, the Army marched to classes. Pardon? No, the, the Army marched to classes, if I remember correctly, ASTP program, but not the Navy. I was in the ROTC, the Reserve Officers Training Corps. At that time, um, the first two years were mandatory. Everyone had to, all males had to take Reserve Officers Training Corps. By the way, ROTC, during the Vietnam anti-war period, it was uh, called ROTC. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't see much difference before and after Pearl Harbor in the amount of work we put in. A little more emphasis on field work after Pearl Harbor. Now, the first two years 
were mandatory, and then you could volunteer or sign up for two additional years uh, advanced. And uh, I guess I was signing up more or less to make sure that I would get my degree and not so much that I wanted to be an officer. <laughs> and uh, uh, the training the last two years uh, was a little, uh, a little more rigorous, a little more field work. I was in the field artillery, and uh, I remember setting up our howitzers on St. Mary's Road. We didn't fire them, but <laughs> we, uh, we fired them in with small uh, ball bearings in the armory. We had conducted fire that way. And uh, the, um, they updated the, the weapon we were working with. They, we started out with the French 75, which was left over from World War I. And it was horse drawn. And the horses were in, um, in the stable where the law building is now. <laughs> and uh, we practiced our, our gates for the different, uh, for the horses in the parking lot right south of where the uh, law building is now. And I had, uh, uh, thinking that we were going to stay with horses before we got motorized, I had bought a pair of, of boots. I thought they looked nice. And uh, <laughs> then uh, when I was a junior, they be we became motorized. Yeah, but we still had, and we upgraded to the uh, 105 howitzer, which I was with uh, all the way through the Philippine campaign. So the 105 became very uh, a, a very familiar weapon. Um, although in the Philippines we had them mounted on M3 tanks, but my boots, uh, what to do with them? I thought, well. I'll keep them because um, they look nice, and uh, I'll wear them to the military ball. <laughs> and uh, I did wear them to the military ball. Uh, and I'm trying to remember my date that night. I think her name was Barbara, but I don't remember her last name. <laughs> so if there isn't. 86 or 87 year old Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if there is, maybe we can meet at the north door. <laughs> we'll get them in touch. <laughs> hmm. so, but I was, they changed the rules uh, uh, so that I had to take basic infantry training after I got my degree, and then go to officer candidate school. But the year before, they were commissioned right upon graduation, but they had taken six weeks of summer training. So that, uh, I felt that uh, I didn't feel like I was ready to go into combat even with that. I needed more. So, uh, uh, we uh, limped along as best we could. What could I sure. tell you? During the war, the girls that I ran around with, the girls that I knew, the men who were on the campus, if they were not in the service, we called them four Fs. <laughs> we didn't have anything to do with them. We didn't like them because they were four Fs. Our friends, the people, the young men who helped to make our social life on this campus, the young black men, were the people from Chinook. We had library dates with them. Most of them had their degrees and everything, but they really enhanced our, our social life. That's what we had fun with. But now, if you weren't in the service and all, and all we called you for F, and we didn't have anything to do with you. Do you remember what the F stood for? I don't know what the I for F. They, I don't know what it stood for, but I knew, they, <laughs> I knew that the army, that, that, that service evidently didn't accept them, or they didn't go, or whatever. 
But if you were not in the service at all, we didn't even like you. <laughs> was there a lot of interaction or, or no interaction between you know, military students and civilian students? Was, it, was, it, was there a separation there? Or, or I mean, you took classes together, I guess, in many cases, right? Well, I was just interested in your remark, you know, that ROTC was mandatory. I, re two years. I remember, though, that there was a choice of being in ROTC or the marching band. Oh. And, uh, and I took the marching band. But <laughs> so. but I guess the marching band was also, they were, they were the military as well. Right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, so we liked you if you were in the military. <laughs> Kevin, he, he's talking about the early years of the war. Ah, okay. Later on, when I was here, the, the football band the marching band was made up of all Navy personnel. Uh, out of the 168, I think it was 168 at that time, there were about 40 musicians and 128 marchers, all of whom wore Navy uniforms and, and made all of the formations, which some of which I passed on, Tom, when we had Dad's Day and all those other good things. Uh, but the band was all Navy personnel. Yeah. Well, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned, I think, is the role, <clears throat> is the, role of uh, the religious foundations on campus at that time. And I was very active in them, and uh, th that was a place where many of the service people from the V-12 and the, and the ASTP uh, came, and also to our local church, uh, which was at that time very near the campus than it is today. But um, I kept a diary for those years, and uh, I've gone back and looked at it. I first went back and looked at it during Ken Burns' uh, presentations. And uh, it has come in very handy because you do forget a lot of things that happen, the, the little details. But uh, I was amazed at, at how many committees I was on, in uh, which were uh, sponsored by a McKinley Foundation, Wesley Foundation, uh, the Congregational Christian uh, and the Disciples of Christ and the Y. And this was a very ecumenical time and we all worked together and had a lot of uh, fun activities, worship activities, a lot of different kinds of social activities in which uh, the service people were incorporated as well as the other people, uh, women I guess, who were, on, uh, who were left on, on campus. And uh, this was something that I didn't specifically remember until I read my diary and it was just something was going on all the time. And women had a, a preeminent role in, in, in the campus structure at that time. It gave us a lot of leadership activities that perhaps we wouldn't have had otherwise. I need to share with you that on this campus during the war, the YWCA was very strong and I was the YWCA girl and uh, we were very strong and that enhanced our social life. You have to remember too that back in the 40s there was segregation, but the YWCA, a lot, we had a lot of the mixtures of the girls, the races and all uh, on this campus. You have to also know that, uh, that during that time we had a debate, uh, the, uh, the debate club. I was the first black girl to serve on the debate team of the University of Illinois. Do any of you remember that John Anderson? Do any of you remember that John Anderson ran for president? Yes. yes. He was on the debate team. He was on the Du Bois debate team. I was on the girls. When he ran for president and he lost oh, or whatever, yeah. and I wrote him and told him, "You never could. You never could debate affirmative, and that's why you lost." <laughs> so I'm guessing the women were the better debaters, the better at, debaters. on campus at that time. You, one thing that struck me when, in, in your interview, though, that uh, to keep in mind that uh, African-American women or men were not allowed to live on campus at that That's time? That's right. We lived out in town. No. Uh, uh, African-Americans, they didn't call us African-Americans that time. They called us Negroes. Not black, not colored, not African-Americans. We were called Negroes at that time, which is fine, which is okay. Some of us are still Negroes. But anyway, we could not live on this campus in the dorms, and so we lived out in town. There was a rule? There was that? a rule. That was just a law in those days. We didn't care. But, uh, we, lived, we made friends with the people in town. We run with them. 
and a lot of our social life, a lot of our church life was with the people in the town. And some of these people are still my friends, and some are still here. But no, we could not live in the dorms at that time. Was there a lot of uh, interaction with people in town, the, the, the residents in Champaign-Urbana at that time? Well, Champaign was my home, so uh, when you go to college in the same town in which you've always lived, you do have dual roles. And uh, I, I think that as my local church, for example, uh, did have a lot of activities. Uh, uh, in a way, they uh, were surrogates for the men who were gone uh, in, in the local church. Uh, I just was recalling some things uh, that had happened. Uh, things happened very fast as far as the draft was concerned in those days. And by August of uh, 40, uh, 42, uh, I noted in my diary that 34 people from my local church had already were already in, in the service because I was one who put up a bulletin board with their names and stars on for them. But yes, I think they were accepted in, in, in uh, local activities. I would think that the, the, the mood, the atmosphere on campus changed because of the course of the war too after Pearl Harbor and the early days of the war when, when things weren't going so well as opposed to when the tide turned and, and by 1944 and 45, the, you know, the optimism, I suppose, had come back. You know, what, 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 was the, what was the atmosphere on campus like at that time? And, and, and one thing that Catherine mentioned in the, in the, uh, in the, the documentary was there was, so much, there was patriotism at a level that we had never seen before and maybe even since. Well, one thing that happened was that um, on uh, December the 10th, I think it was, there was a convocation on campus, and, which we all kind of went to, um, in which we were told to, as much as we could to stay in school. And then uh, a few, about a month later, I think it was in February of that <coughs> year, Eleanor Roosevelt came to campus. And I can still see her in Huff Jim and the hat she was wearing. <laughs> she always wore hats. And that was very inspiring, too. And she was urging us to, you know, do our best, stay, stay in school, do our best. So uh, I think we got some encouragement uh, to do that. And uh, then I think also uh, after the war ended, uh, after VJ Day, there was another convocation uh, of quite different nature uh, on campus, and there were a couple of days of holidays. Um, I stayed on on campus uh, and earned two more degrees after that from the University of Illinois and began work in, in libraries at, at that time. And so to go back to an earlier question that you, you posed, um, I did know many of the returning service people who did come to school after uh, they were released from uh, the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Corps, and uh, so many of them were my very good friends, and <clears throat> I think we benefited from their maturity and how they were uh, perhaps different from other people who might have been around at that time. I think maybe at this time we'd uh, open it up for questions uh, that you may have of, uh, of our panelists. I mean, if you had some experiences you want to share, questions you had about what life was like on campus uh, during the war years. Uh, Kimberly, and we have one, uh, two people with, with microphones. If you just uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll find you and, uh, and get you the mic and, and if you have a question. Go, let's, let's, get, let's get a microphone to you first of all. There we go. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't say anything about the victory gardens that everybody had during the war. That was, I don't, most of the people had victory gardens. Everyone had one. <laughs> victory gardens? Huh? Right. I didn't say anything because I was, grew up on a farm. My home was a farm. We always had a garden. <laughs> I don't think there were many victory gardens on the campus. I mean, well, I know, but we didn't.
any other questions? Or, or if you have your own uh, remembrances of what, uh, what life was like here on campus. The question of the fore aft part of it. If you were somebody who was going to get drafted in a hurry, you were 1A. I think that if you weren't quite as good physically, you were 2. If you were a little less, you were 3. Then if you were not going to get drafted at all, then you were 4F. We didn't like them either. <laughs> <laughs> were, there, were there also uh, conscientious objectors on campus as yeah. well? I didn't know one or two, and I respected them and didn't question their sincerity. But they took the, you were in the same classes with them? Oh, yeah. These were all civilian classes. Uh, my parents were both students here during the war, and uh, my father was a V-12. And his main memory, besides meeting my mother, who lived in a fraternity house, because all the fraternities had closed down, she was in Lowell Hall at 310 Gregory. Um, his main memory was he got his degree in two and a half years. And he was 19 when he graduated. And his main memory was just always being tired. And he hated the marching at the football games because it took study time away. And when he graduated, several universities wanted him to come and do graduate work. But he said he didn't want to do it because he was so sick of studying. He was so tired. All he wanted to do was get married, get out of the service, and go lead a normal life, which is what he did until Korea when he was called up again. <laughs> but do you remember just being sick of school, being tired? His name was Richard Smith, by the way. He graduated in February 46. I don't know if you knew him. I? Yeah. No, I don't recall the name, but no, I wasn't sick of, I, I rather enjoyed it. I, I didn't have any problems with it. <laughs> well, they... And I was the same way. I, when, I came, when I came here, I was, when I left home, when I came here, I was 17 years and five months old. Uh, and when I was discharged after two years of service, I was still only 19. Uh, and I was, I wasted another year before I got my bachelor's degree because I decided to slow down a little. And I, when I graduated, I ended up with 168 or 174 hours. I, I, I just kind of spread it around. I think it was 1943 that they began, went to a three-semester uh, curriculum, and there was not much time between semesters. And the fall semester would begin in October and run through. So. It could very well be because that's very intensive to, to and go. It, and that was like the 16 weeks, then one week off, and then 16 right. more weeks. Yeah. Uh -uh. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that was the schedule from 1943, which is when the V-12 program started, mm -hmm. until 1946 when they tossed us out. What did Navy people learn in the Champaign-Urbana area? Obviously, obviously not. <laughs> we didn't have any ships to work on here or anything like that. But what, uh, what, what did, what did you get at, at, at this school? And what, what was the training, the training regimen for people in the Navy? Well, well, I don't know. Primarily the rules of the road and and but now we, the people, the, like the Army, the people who completed the program before it was disbanded. The, those people, who, and there were some who, it started in 43, some people graduated in 44, and they had to go to uh, officers training on the East Coast, and they had three months of, they had three months of pure Navy training before they went into the fleet. Uh, uh, I really want to thank you folks uh, for your service and uh, for all of you being here because, uh, well, I'm Army, uh, U.S. Army, Corps, uh, Vietnam. And uh, my question is, is my dad was World War II. 
Missouri. He was there uh, when it was commissioned and then down through the, through the uh, surrender. And my, uh, his brother was uh, Patton, with Patton, all through the whole thing. But uh, they both came home. But they never talked uh, at all. My dad had no interest in, um, it, it, I believe my mom said it changed him. And he never really talked much about it. His brother never talked much about it. Uh, and uh, I, I was curious uh, how you, you uh, what was your feelings after that? And then when I was called up in 68, uh, uh, he had no comment. He simply expected go. Uh, you know, you, you go. So I was just curious. How, how, did you talk much about your experiences? And I also want to thank the ladies and everybody who went through that era. Uh, my mom and dad went through from the 20s, 30s, depression. Uh, and I, I guess all I heard after, when I grew up was thank God for Roosevelt. I, so. I guess I would make the following observation. Uh, I remember, I recall, I told you that I had, I had three other brothers who were in the service. Uh, the two that were overseas never talked about anything. My brother that was on the Omaha beach invasion as the combat engineers, the only thing I know the only thing he ever told me about it was the fact that they said the invasion started at 6 o'clock, but his outfit had to go in at 3.30 because as combat engineers, they were responsible for removing the, the, the obstacles that were in the water. And uh, he, after the war ended, some member of his unit wrote a book about them. And if I recall correctly, about 35% of his outfit was, didn't survive June the 6th, 1944. Uh, he went from June, he went until the war ended. As a matter of fact, uh, he was in Europe until the Japanese uh, surrendered. He was preparing to take a ship and go from Germany to Japan, and then when the Japan uh, <clears throat> gave up, why then he came back to the States. But he, from that time on, I know, except for the book that I have, which goes through where they were, uh, he never spoke of it until the day he died. I think the difference is that the people who are in combat don't talk about it. I mean, those of us who were fortunate enough to stay home, we can regale you with funny stories about what we did and how we escaped from the SPs and the MPs when we were able to get out of town without being caught. But I don't, you know, once you, once you got on the boat, correct, you went, you went over, you didn't talk about that anymore. It must have been tough to concentrate on, on studies at times with, uh, you know, knowing friends or relatives that, that, that were already overseas. And, 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 and just the, the pressure that you had, uh, you know, awaiting maybe being dispatched somewhere else. And I, I would guess that, uh, that studying was, was tough. There uh, been a lot of talk about V-12 and ASTP. A little th addition to that, if you were in V-12, you could participate in athletics. If you were in ASTP, you couldn't. Gene Vance, one of the whiz kids, was here in the ASTP and couldn't play for Illinois. On the ASTP, um, their training didn't include very much on uh, field work or uh, any strictly combat training. And a number of the ASTP were taken in to a, the 106th Division, which was in the Battle of the Bulge. And these young men were just not prepared. And the losses of the 106th Division were somewhere around 40% in the Battle of the Bulge. They were not even taught how to shoot a carbine. Uh, but Dick, what you referred to, that was an Army rule, yeah. not a university rule. Yeah, that was an Army, Army rule, rule. Yeah. Sure. sure. Because, well, I, don't, well, I know you remember. <clears throat> And I, I think this is past the statute of limitations, but Ray Elliott searched anywhere for 
football players, one of whom was Sam Zatkoff, who I don't know that Sam was a student <clears throat> at the university. He was a Navy man who was one of the corpsmen in the, uh, signed by the United States Navy, but he played on the football team. Uh, but so did a number of the other the Navy people, the V-12 people did play on the football team and on the basketball team. Took your place. Now, did, did the ASDP uh, men march at the football games too? Or they, they, they weren't in, involved in the athletics, but... Uh... No. The ASDP hadn't really started by the time I left campus in 43. By the way, I ushered at that famous Michigan game in 1939 I was in the West Stands. <laughs> but the big athletic program was the Whiz Kids doing WW3 right. too. And they were all they were all Navy or no, all uh, some civilian. Art Matisson. Yeah, until they <laughs> entered the service. <laughs> uh, Art Matisson was in my ret class. He was captain of the Whiz Kids, and then Andy Phillips, or Andy, uh, Gene Vance, Andy Phillips, and Smiley. Smiley. Yeah. They won uh, two conference championships, I think. One of them sold, and one of them shared. In order to save gas, they, uh, if they had out-of-town games, they would play them on Saturday, they'd play two when they went up uh, away from home. Play one on Saturday and one on Monday. My turn. <laughs> uh, some of you may be aware, but Frasca Field, a group of us uh, actually have started the Illinois Military Aviation Hall of Fame, which is quite a project. We find out that there's a lot of people that weren't actually uh, recognized as well as they should be. And a lot of people in Illinois have been through an awful lot. Um, we've gone actually uh, interviewed Paul Tibbetts and put him on our Illinois Military Aviation Hall of Fame and others. It's amazing because part of it is an interview in a private room and they open up and say things that they haven't said uh, since World War II and it feels so much better as a result of it. Uh, we have the pictures of these people that um, ran into an Air Force base. Maybe we'd like to go see that sometime. Uh, but it's been a tremendous experience. We have. Next, I'm going to be uh, put in the Hall of Fame. It's a gentleman in World War II. I don't remember his name. Uh, he flew with TBMs in World War II. He uh, was involved in seeking a Japanese uh, submarine. And we're going to be going down, and he's no longer alive. He got killed there. But he has a sister, 95 years old. I hope she's alive when we enter in our Hall of Fame. She lives in the Southern Illinois, Carbondale. So we're going to bring a couple of our airplanes, the Zero and the uh, Wildcat, and actually uh, have a little show out there, including another Hall of Famer. And then we'll give her the information on the uh, who's a member of the Hall of Fame. What do you tell? Uh your kids and your grandkids. How 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 have you been able to share you know your experiences of, of uh, those those years with uh, with your children and grandchildren and, and and have they been interested in talking to you and, and trying to pick your brain about what it was like back then? <laughs> before everybody leaves, before everybody leaves. My, as I said, my daughter is here, and I have shared so much about World War II and about my campus experiences and all of that. And my granddaughter just cannot believe all of that I'm saying about this. Did they do this? Did they do that? Um, and so, but, but some of the younger generation, they don't seem to be as interested in this. And in the schools is where we really need to tell the children about this. Yes. We really need to, because some of the students uh, really don't, they don't know about the Battle of the Budge. They don't know about D-Day. My husband was at D-Day. My husband was at the Battle of the Budge. But when you talk about that to some of the younger people, and you're my nieces and nephews, they don't know about it. They don't understand. So we have to keep telling them 
we have to tell the story, just as we're doing here. Any other comments or questions on people? Raise your hand and we'll get a, get a mic here. I, I was just about to let the uh, Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to Plus thank three. our panelists. And our, our moderator, Tom, and our partners. Uh, and I also want to just make a point that WL is doing it, its best to get these oral histories into the hands of teachers so they can use them as primary source materials. And we have a connection with teachers in our area, and we are making those materials available just for the reason that Dr. Wright was saying. So um, we do have an evaluation on your seat. If you can just hang in there for a few more minutes, we are very interested in what you thought of our program. We're always trying to improve what we do. Uh, your feedback is very valuable. If you could please fill that out and just leave it at the front table, that would be great. Have a safe trip home. Thank you very much, and good night. Kim, if anyone needs a pencil, I have golf pencils. You can use them tomorrow on the course. He died uh, about a year ago. Yeah, but he was